I'm, I'm uh, happy to learn uh, that our next guest has joined us by telephone, uh, one of the true chroniclers over time of President Kennedy and of the Kennedy family. Hugh Soddy was around certainly to write the first draft of history if it happened at the White House for a couple decades there, and Hugh Soddy of Time Magazine is with us. And Hugh, I'd like to hear how your thoughts have been today. Well, it's almost impossible to put, put your mind around this, Brian. Uh, it, it, uh, I've cast back to try to remember other cases of history or prominent families uh, that have had tragedies, and many have, but I don't ever recall such a sequence of deaths. I mean, I may not be the best historian, but uh, it's just shocking, the, the harshness of it and the suddenness of it. And there's there's nothing there's no way to to rationalize it. It's it's coincidence. You could say that in John Kennedy's case, he was a political figure, and they're subject to to some degree to assault. Bobby was somewhat careless, and so were the kids. Uh, uh, that's true, but but this isn't a case of that, uh, as far as we know. Anyway, this seemed quite rational, reasonable. I assume John Kennedy was a licensed pilot, short pop up there. It's just something that, that, that did happen, but it happens in this environment of the world's greatest uh, legend, running legend, the Kennedys. And John was the glamorous edge of that, uh, the heir of it, and now I guess that legend just marches on, but it's filled with tragedy. Hugh, in your writings, and especially in the thick volume by Teddy Sorensen on the President's administration, the pre administration of John F. Kennedy, there are wonderful chapters about the cameo roles those kids played in just about any level meeting. Uh, tapes just released by the Johnson, uh, the Kennedy Library, have uh, young John John, as the media called him, running in to interrupt a meeting on uh, his father's lap and taking over control of the dictaphone. Tell us about the presence of John Kennedy in the Oval Office and the environs. Well, it, it was. He was uh, well, first off, you have to realize how young we were in those days and how young the president was and how young the kids were. So you had that marvelous uh, scene. And the, and the Kennedys, a big kind of roiling family, and John John was always, uh, when he got his legs, uh, wandering over there. And there were episodes like that. There's the famous picture of him peering out from under the desk. He called the desk his cave. Uh, he and Caroline had played there, and then he had this little dance. The president would clap his hands, and he'd bounce over the carpet. You get a little glimpse of that now and then. Sometimes Kennedy had to send him back to the, to the mansion when the meeting was important enough, and Dave Powers would march with him. Dave was the assistant to John Kennedy, would march with him back over there, but uh, and then, it, then there was a bowl of candy on Evelyn Lincoln's desk, and he would help himself. And the, Kennedy, the president tried in vain to limit him to one piece of candy, <laughs> yeah, but that. the rule never applied. Uh, there's a wonderful picture someplace. Uh, the president was re meeting with Fanfani, the, the Italian prime minister, and there's John with a stuffed animal rolling on the lawn, and everybody kind of laughing. But, but he did. He came into meetings uh, where McNamara and Rusk and all those people were. And I think, uh, to be honest with you, that's kind of a wonderful thing. That eases tension, leavens things a little bit. It does. It does. Uh, Hugh, there will also be people who say the wealthy, well-off, prominent don't travel like the rest of America. They, they travel their own way. They spend more money at it, but they have, uh, they have their own planes. That's why celebrities seem to die at a higher rate per capita than ordinary Americans. We certainly, the news media is dominated by it. They have their own ways. This family was no different. Well, I think that's true. They live on the edge. There, is, there isn't any doubt about that. I suspect, though, that John Kennedy, one of the reasons he probably wanted to fly, in addition just to the fascination of it, was to be alone, just to get away from this crush, this absolutely brutal interest that the American people had in him and his family. And uh, I, can, I could understand that uh, the idea of you being your own private pilot and having your own plane would take you away from, uh, uh, from that crush all the time so but but you're right about it uh, when you can afford private planes and boats and uh, and things like that why it tends to be a, a case of uh, more risk probably do you buy Hugh did you ever the fact that there was a grid somewhere on a master plan for this family and Joe uh, jr. from birth was the anointed one he was going to be the next president he dies in an experimental mission 
Uh, and the mantle turns to Jack. Do you think there was a plan for the next generation? I think it was in old Joe's mind, the ambassador's mind. I don't think there's any uh, question about that. Uh, young Joe Kennedy was uh, absolutely the perfect political uh, person. He had, the, he had the brains, he had the personality, the energy, and everything like that. And uh, he was killed in the war, and I think uh, with some reluctance, by the way, I, because I don't think old Joe, the ambassador, thought that Jack Kennedy would had, had that endurance. Number one, Jack Kennedy had been sick all of these teenage years, and so the idea that this kind of sickly kid would, uh, would go in and uh, be able to perform like that, uh, probably uh, Joe arrived at that conclusion <laughs> reluctantly. But in his mind, yes, I think that he marched right down the road. And Bobby, too. It was Joe Kennedy that, uh, when they were considering whether Bobby Kennedy was to be the attorney general or not, Old Joe Kennedy told me in one of the few interviews he ever had that, uh, yes, he ought to be, that Bobby Kennedy had a right to, to that, that he had a right to public, national public office. And then beyond that, he said he's one of the few people he could trust, so mm. the president could trust. So I think there was a plan of sort. It probably didn't look like a box score for a baseball team or anything like that, but uh, I think it was in the old, the old gentleman's mind. Hugh, there aren't many people who could walk up uh, as of yesterday. We don't know how this will turn out and say to John Kennedy, I knew you when you were born. I was around then. I saw you grow up. Uh, you've done pretty well for yourself. <laughs> and you're one of them. Well, yes, that's true. I think there are more. He's still a pretty young guy, so there'll be some others. But, but we did watch him pretty closely in the White House, and it, it was a wonderful time uh, in those years, which heightens the tragedy even more. Hugh Seide, uh, one-time dean of the White House uh, uh, Correspondents, uh, as uh, well-known a byline as there uh, ever has been in magazine writing, certainly in this country. Hugh, it's good to hear from you. Thank, Thank you, you very Brian. much. Hugh Seide of Time.